want to say thank you because I do have three board members here today with me. Dale's here, Emily Lenovo, who is our president of our board of directors, and Hardik Patel, put your hand up, Hardik. Everybody knows Hardik. <laughs> he's at every event. We were just trying to figure out if he's got a clone somewhere. He's everywhere. <laughs> and uh, so I, I want to thank my board members for uh, attending today. Uh, well, I've got a captured audience, and Jill says I have three and a half minutes. I'm down to three, right? Uh, a couple of things. Um, before I get into why we're here today and what you're talking about, you'll see on your tables a little flyer. So we are one of 26 boards in the province funded by the Ministry of Labor, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Our whole role in this community is to understand the labor force and workforce, um, labor force issues you face and try and work with the community partners to implement something to address those through workforce development. In the 2022 labor market plan that we released in February of last year, that's a three-year plan. It's one of our deliverables for the government. It's a strategic plan, and one of the key things that came out of that uh, was employers during our consultations last year said, there's a disconnect going on between Loyalist College, which is a fantastic college here, offers lots of courses, and what employers need at a local level for training, be they small programs, or larger program. They said there's just this disconnect going on. So, on March the 9th, I hope to see a whole bunch of you back here for a free breakfast because we're putting loyalists in the room. And it's going to be your opportunity as employers to speak up and tell them what do you need for training. If they don't hear from you, they can't look at whether they're able to develop some training. Jeremy Lauren and his team will be here they want to listen to what you say, they want to hear, and they build to explain to you, yep, that's a great idea, we can do that. Or they may say, no, we cannot do that because the Ministry of Training College and University, or Ministry of Training College and University, I think they're still their name. Uh, you never know, government changes their names all the time. Uh, they are the ones who put the policy directives in place for colleges, and they are the ones who direct what they can and cannot do in terms of new courses. There are a lot of stuff that the college can do through uh, the Knowledge and Training Center, short-term courses, uh, or continuing edge courses. When it comes to maybe implementing a new two-year course or diploma course, there are some parameters around which they cannot do things. So, we're inviting players to come and have that voice. Have a little bit to eat, and then have a roundtable discussion. So, I just want to promote that out. Um, you can register. The registration is now open. It's on our website. Why are we here today? Another thing that uh, came out of both the labor market plan and a survey we do. It's an employer survey. It is a demand side survey. And one of the things we ask about is how employers are advertising their jobs. The number one way, and this is called the employer one survey, and there are these surveys running across all of Eastern Ontario and all of Southwestern Ontario. Number one way that employers are advertising, anybody got an idea? Word of mouth. Today's technology, or today's uh, the way the labor market is today, it is a job seeker's paradise. That's what we call it. It's an extremely tight labor market. If you rely on word of mouth, or putting a sign in front of your plant, or your company, or something like that, or putting a sign in your window, you are up against a huge market of, of people, job seekers, who have moved to technology, and they're using technology. And so, today, what we've been doing is a series of presentations to help you as employers, as businesses, understand how to best use technology as part of your attraction, as part of your retention, and how you can also incorporate that into your you know, websites and things like that. So, I'm happy to introduce uh, Zach Talsma. He is the owner of Lure Marketing, and he'll be discussing the importance of corporate culture and social media outreach through the uh, that it can be used to attract and retain employees, promote job opportunities, and promote your business. So without further ado, Zach, it's all yours. Oh, you're good. So thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, as Brad mentioned, we've got sort of two semi-related subjects we're talking about, uh, and that is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, corporate culture, why it's important in recruiting and retaining employees, 
and also social media, why you should be using it, and again, how you can use it uh, for recruitment. The first thing we're going to talk about is what actually is company culture or corporate culture, you'll hear it. Uh, it's defined as the shared values, goals, attributes, and practices that characterize an organization. Uh, you can also think of it as a shared ethos of an organization. So basically, uh, how people feel about the work they're doing, the values of the company, where the company is going, and what part of it they're kind of playing. Um, it's also important to know that whether or not you're actively managing your corporate culture or not, it's happening. It, it happens regardless of whether you're actively involved in it or not. So you better be actively involved in it so it can be the way you want it to be, rather than just kind of how it ends up. So what uh, contributes to the company culture? This isn't a complete list, but it's a few of kind of your main, I guess, uh, points. Uh, the one is the company vision. So Airbnbs uh, create a world where anyone can belong everywhere. Just kind of sets the tone what you're looking to achieve with the company. Uh, then you have company values. So these would be, you know, do you believe in quality? Do you believe in value? Do you believe in, you know, supporting local? Those types of things. Uh, the company size and structure, so you can imagine the culture at a startup with two or three employees is going to be much different than one with several hundred employees, let's say. Uh, the working environment, are you all working together in an office? Are there people out on the road? Uh, is there you know, people working remotely? That kind of thing. Uh, how, your how the employers or management uh, interact with employees, how employees interact with each other, uh, and also how they interact with customer or clients, and how customers or clients interact with employees. All that will contribute to the company culture. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is a phenomenon that's been known as the Great Resignation. It started in 2021, it's still somewhat happening today, uh, and it's basically the mass exodus of uh, professionals from traditional workplaces. Uh, started, uh, well, not at the start of the pandemic, but around 2021, um, a bit, well, so let's say sort of spring 2021 to more or less today. Um, and in that time, just under 50 million people in the United States quit their job, and about a quarter of Canadians have switched uh, careers, and that's, again, since about a year and a half. Um, the prevailing theory is that many people just had uh, epiphanies, you know, work-life balance kind of things. They weren't doing what they thought they'd be doing. You know, in the pandemic, we all had a lot of time to sit and think. And a lot of people thought and figured, well, it's time to change careers. I'm not doing what I want to be doing. And or, you know, maybe I'm in the right industry, but maybe the company's not the right fit or whatever the case may be. They want to move closer to home. And so, yeah, right around a quarter of the workforce has changed jobs because of that. So why is company culture important in that sort of a context? Um, well, one, you're going to decrease employee turnover. So all those people that are switching jobs, you're going to have a lot less of that if you have a good company culture. If people are happy at the job, they like the company, they like what you stand or where you stand on certain issues, uh, they're going to be a lot more willing to stay. And in fact, there's 40% higher employee retention uh, with companies that manage their culture versus ones that don't. <coughs> Uh, better recruiting as well. So people tend to now do a lot of research uh, when they're looking to you know, apply for jobs or before the interviews. Um, obviously, you know, compensation is still a very important factor, but company culture is becoming more and more a factor, again, especially uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, so for that reason, uh, companies that have a positive company culture and can get that across to people, uh, will get a 70% increase in the quality of their hires. Uh, and also, just from a you know, productivity standpoint, happy employees tend to work a little bit harder. People are getting more fulfillment out of the company. They believe in the company. They're going to work a little harder than those that don't, about 12% uh, on average. And just a few other quick company culture stats. 95% uh, employees say that company culture is more important than compensation. Uh, right around half of employees <clears throat> said that company culture influences their experience more than the workplace or the technology they use. And in the U.S., 35% uh, claim uh, that they would pass on the ideal job if the company culture wasn't a right fit. 
So now how do you build a successful company culture? Again, this isn't necessarily an exhaustive list of everything you can do, but just a few things to keep in mind. Uh, one is to have that ideal for your company in mind, so going back to the Airbnb, have that sort of a tagline that kind of gets the point across, of like why did you start the company basically? What, what does your company do? Who do they serve? What's your end goal? Uh, get that across and have that as kind of the baseline for where everyone should be uh, in the company from the top down. Uh, then stick to your core values. So if you don't stick to your core values, so for instance, if you're a restaurant who's talking about supporting local farmers and then you know, you're getting a bunch of frozen food coming in and your employees are unpacking it and throwing it in the microwave, obviously they're not going to be um, believing in the company as much as if you actually are doing what you're saying. So stick to your company, <clears throat> stick to your company's core values. Um, whatever you say, back it up. Uh, listen and provide feedback. So if you have employees that are doing a really good job, let them know they're doing a really good job. If you have employees that aren't, provide feedback for how they can improve and how they can stick to uh, your values, the company goal and vision. Um, and listen to their feedback as well, you know, where are you falling short or where do they think that maybe there's some improvements to be made in the company. Uh, people that have sort of more of an active role in the company are going to be a lot more engaged and uh, will, yeah, work harder. They feel like they're, they're a part of the company rather than just an employee necessarily. Uh, and establishing a flexible workplace, it's not always possible, um, but if you can, you know, the, the, the nine to five office job is becoming more and more a thing of the past. Um, people now, again, a, a big reason for that, the Great Resignation, is people's um, either commute, you know, let's say Toronto, you got a two-hour commute every day, they're going to switch to something where maybe they have a half an hour commute now. So establishing a flexible work environment where they could work from home a couple of days a week might be the difference between keeping that employee and losing that employee. It's not to say you want to send everyone to work remotely just because that's what they want, but, you know, to have a little flexibility is definitely going to help quite a bit. Um, and then giving your employees some level of autonomy. You know, no one really likes to be micromanaged and told how to do every little aspect of uh, what they're doing every day. So just trust in their decision-making abilities. Again, if they make a mistake, you can always correct it, get them back in line. But uh, giving them the opportunity to make a mistake sometimes is a, is a good thing. And then creating opportunities for growth. Uh, you know, again, no one really wants to be stuck in a dead-end job either. So if there's opportunities for advancement, you know, make that known. Uh, but it can also be even just cross-training. I know uh, Costco, one of their big things is if you work at Costco, eventually you're trained in every <coughs> single role there. Um, so one, it creates, you know, an employee that's obviously got a lot more skills and can uh, understand every aspect of the company. Uh, but it also just kind of... I would just say kind of freshens it up and you can kind of see all the different opportunities that might be there um, and you're just not doing the same thing day in, day out, day in, day out. So um, those kind of things can make a difference as well. And then also staying consistent. Um, so again, not suddenly all of a sudden changing all the values of the company just because that's the way the market's going or, you know, you kind of want to stick to your guns. Stay consistent. Don't have certain employees that have certain benefits that no one else has, you know. Uh, I used to work at a company where, you know, there was a really good salesman, and he could pretty much do whatever he wanted, uh, including just leaving for, their, you know, a couple hours in the middle of the day, coming back. That kind of stuff uh, really got on the nerves of a lot of other people who didn't have those things. Um, so, yeah, real detriment to the culture of that company I work. So that's it for company culture. I should have actually mentioned at the top, if anyone had any questions, to just kind of raise your hand throughout. Um, so I'll just take a quick minute to say if there's anything else about company culture. If not, you can always talk to me after the presentation or I'm trying to rush a little bit because my presentation is a little longer than <laughs> ideal. So uh, if we have time at the end for questions too, you can feel free to ask them. Uh, so now we're going to be getting a little bit into social media. Uh, and the first bit is why, you know, pretty much every business should be on social media in one form or the other. Uh, and the first is just increased brand awareness. The number one thing for, about social media is it's a way to get your name out there uh, and get your name out there relatively inexpensively. Um, it just makes your business a lot easier for people to find and connect with. 
Uh, the second reason why you got to be on social media is the increased brand loyalty. Uh, part of the reason for that is that top of mind awareness. So you can imagine there's two businesses that do the same thing. One you're seeing every day on social media, the other you're not. They're going to be the one you think of when it comes to that product or service. Uh, the other reason for brand loyalty is the engagement that you get on social media. So social media is not necessarily, I mean they do have an advertising platform, but even on their ads there is a back and forth. There's an opportunity to comment, to like, to share. Um, so it's a more engaging form of marketing than just a regular search ad would be, let's say. Uh, social media advertising can also generate leads, online sales, or can help in recruiting drives. Um, so again, regular sort of social media posts you can think of almost as a branding uh, type of an exercise where you're just getting your name out there as much as you can. You're not going to get a lot of sales from it. But with some targeted social media ads, you can promote an online store, you can get people to sign up for events, you can get people to you know, fill out a job application form on your website. Um, social media also gives job seekers a glimpse behind your business culture. So again, as we mentioned in the culture section, a lot of people now, and Brad actually alluded to that as well, a lot of people now are using technology when they're doing uh, either looking for jobs or just kind of seeing what's out there. Um, and social media is one of the big things you're going to use. You know, your website and your social media are going to be the two things that are really accessible for, for anyone. Um, and your website is going to be really good for people getting an idea of kind of what you do, maybe how current you are with technology, uh, the size of the business, those sort of basic things. And you can talk about your company culture in there. Uh, but social media is really where you're going to be able to show it off because you can give real world examples of, you know, again, let's say go back to that restaurant example, you know, going to a farm locally, sourcing some ingredients, getting it into the restaurant, you know, showing off some unique things that you do. It's a lot easier on social media than it is on your website to get that across. Uh, and the last reason is simply that people are there every day. So a lot of people think of social media as sort of a young person's uh, thing, uh, but that's no longer the case. You know, Facebook, uh, I believe now people 65 plus, there are about two thirds of them are on Facebook. So literally everyone's on Facebook, if nothing else. 74% um, of the world's internet users are active on at least one of them. So it's not just the, you know, 20, 30 year olds, you know, not just students, it's, it's everyone. Uh, yeah, so I have it right there actually. So as, even as of 2016, so it's even more now, 72% of people between the age of 50 and 64 and 62% of people over the age of 65 are active. So not just have a, a Facebook profile, but are actively on at least once a month. So now this kind of leads us to what you should post. And this is the number one thing when people are starting a social media uh, venture that they just don't know what to do. You know, okay, I'm going to post, okay, I'll just take you know, photo of a product and post that kind of thing. So, you can absolutely do that, but you really want to be focusing on value when you're posting. So, you want to post things which are going to bring some sort of a value to whoever's looking at it. Um, now, value can be many different things. It can be teaching someone something they might not have known about the business or your industry. Uh, it could be just simply making them laugh. You know. It, Different things are going to provide value in different ways. Uh, but in general, you're going to want to try and stick to uh, what they call the 80-20 rule, which is 80% of your posts should be value-based, 20% should be promotion. Uh, that's not a necessarily a hard and fast rule. It's a good place to start. You can kind of, you know, through yourself and the engagement with your posts over time, see maybe you can do a little more or a little less promotion. I will look, though, uh, to give you a little bit more concrete ideas, let's say, when it comes to social media posts. Uh, so the one is showing off your core values using real world examples. So again, going back to the company culture, what does your company believe in? What are your values? Get those across in your posts. So you know, if you notice something, again, uh, going back to that restaurant example, that same thing, you know, you're out at a farm, you're grabbing a few things, <coughs> take a photo of that. Hey, we're out here, we're promoting small business, we're promoting local farmers. Um, yeah, just practice what you preach, basically. Uh, the other thing is develop a brand personality and stick to it. So the brand personality 
is the same as a you know person's personality. Basically, you can describe them the same. Every brand is going to have a personality, whether it's you know fun, edgy, creative, or it's more serious uh, and professional. You know, you're going to want to think of if your business was a person, what would that person's personality be? Write those down and have that in mind when you're doing your posts. And this this is true of not just social media, but any sort of marketing that you're doing. It should all be coming from a consistent voice. Um, it can be a little jarring, you know, sometimes if you have these super, super professional posts and then, you know, the next post is a meme, you know, where it's like some, you know, crazy cat lady kind of meme or something like that. It's kind of like, it's not, it doesn't feel like it's coming from the same person um, and it, that, that'll come across. So you don't try to be everything to everyone, just try to be, you know, sort of your ideal to your, to your target market. Um, you also want to give uh, followers a glimpse behind the scenes of your business. So, what's it like to run your business? What are your employees like? Again, this is kind of getting a little bit of the company culture across. Uh, meeting, you know, learning more about the employees. People liking people like doing business with people. So, if you can show off that sort of human element and sort of the, the behind the scenes, uh, the, those types of posts usually do pretty well. Uh, and again, for recruiting, can help quite a bit. Uh, highlighting new products and services. So a lot of people think that you know you need to be sort of hard selling everything on social media or, or marketing in general. That's not always the case. Social media is really good for uh, again more engagement type posts. So you can do more of a uh, getting your passion for your business across. So you know kind of two examples. If I'm selling this computer, a hard sell would be here's a new computer. It's great. Here are the specs. Here's the price. We only have 10 left, come on and get them. The other way to do that is more, hey, look at this great computer, here's why I'm really excited about it, here's why I decided to carry it. You know, it's got all these great features, if you want to come out and try it, you know, we've got one, you know, running on in the showroom. So you're not really, you're promoting it, you're getting the same sort of information across in terms of the features, but you're not feeling like you're an advertisement, you're feeling like it's more of, again, this is why I'm so excited about what I do. And that's, that's what you kind of want to get across on social media. Uh, also, you want to get a, you're going to want to show involvement in community. Uh, big difference with you know local small businesses versus you know Walmart, Amazon, you name them, is presence in the community. You know you're here, you're supporting local business. You're a local business that needs support yourself, uh, and show that off. So you know photos of yourself and employees at local events, enjoying you know certain things that are going on in the community. <coughs> Uh, sponsorship of local events or organizations, charities, that kind of thing. Uh, and also just content, even if it doesn't have anything to do with you, just supporting you know, local events uh, or organizations or you know, whatever initiatives in the area uh, that you believe in. And then also sharing reviews and testimonials. So if you get any you know, Google or, or social media reviews, sharing them on social media just gives you that social proof that, hey, other people are here. Other people are enjoying, you know, what this company's doing. Why don't you check them out, kind of thing. Uh, a few ways you can get the most out of your social media efforts. So this is assuming you're doing your own social media. Uh, one is to set aside a chunk of time in the week for social media. One of the biggest uh, issues I see with a lot of small businesses is I mean, you don't have any time. So social media just kind of gets put into, oh, I didn't post anything today. I'll just, I'll do this and then get back to what I was doing kind of thing. A much better way of doing it, it's gonna save you time and it's gonna get you a lot better posts, is to set aside you know, two, three hours, whatever, one time per week, shut off everything else, focus on social media. It's going to give you time to think of the proper post, the proper wording, you're not gonna be rushed on anything. It'll also, there are scheduling tools I should mention so you don't have to post all of this at once. You'll have scheduling tools that'll let you, you know, post them evenly through the week. Um, but it will basically make sure that you have a good spread of posts, so you know you're not looking back and saying, "Oh no, I've you know completely forgotten about this new product or service that I wanted to promote," or "I've done four review posts in a row, but I have nothing talking about this event that's coming up next week." So it just lets you kind of plan everything out a lot better and make sure that you have a good spread of posts and that you're getting to everything you want to get to. Uh, to help you with that, developing a social media calendar 
that you can plan out at least in you know vague detail six eight weeks of posts you know even again something as simple as I know I have this event coming up in three weeks I'm gonna put a post you know a week before that to promote it or I want to do a video about this certain thing I'm gonna remind myself you know okay in two weeks I gotta do this video so I'm gonna put a post there so just having some sort of a way of visualizing your next again six weeks eight weeks whatever it is of posts to again look to see do you have a good spread of different topics are you getting you know maybe photos and videos uh, good spread of those uh, what do you need for these posts coming up so it's not a last minute thing where you're thought oh I forgot to take a photo of that you know you're going to now be able to see a couple weeks in advance that you need that photo or that video or whatever that piece is that you need to complete that post uh, you're also going to want to boost your posts Boosting just the term that Meta, so Facebook, Instagram, uh, uses for sort of a basic uh, ad for a post. Um, social media is no longer free, I would say. I mean, you can do it for free, but the difference between doing no promotion and doing $50 worth of promotion a month is, in some cases, you know, five, six, seven thousand more people reached. So you're spending all this time. And you know, if you have a few hundred people that follow your page, or even let's say a thousand people that follow your page, you're doing a couple posts a week, three, four posts per week maybe, and you're getting a couple thousand people a month to see those posts for $50. If you can get that up to 6,000 or 7,000 people, you know, triple the results. It's one, very reasonable. Uh, that's a very reasonable goal to have for that. And two, you're kind of justifying all that time you're putting into the social media. Uh, and again, for $50, it's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, now, when it comes to advertising, though, it's also very easy to waste a lot of money. Um, the sort of default audience uh, for Facebook is everyone who lives in Canada. I really doubt that anyone in this room is really marketing <laughs> to everyone that lives in Canada. So you're going to want to pay close attention to that targeting and narrow it down to what your ideal audience would be. Uh, and then you're also going to want to track your results. So rather than just sort of blindly advertising and, and trying different posts, you're going to want to look at the results of those posts to see which ones are getting the most engagement, which ones are getting the most reach, and continue on uh, boosting those types of posts versus other ones that aren't doing as well. Uh, and you can even see things uh, within Facebook at least, uh, broken down by age range, gender, location, so you can see maybe certain, again, age ranges are responding to certain things or certain genders are responding to certain things that you can then use to, again, just create more effective ads for those uh, subsets of your target audience. So the social media ad platforms give you, you know, how many people you reach, how many people you engage, how many people click through to your website, but you don't really get anything once they got to your website, what happened? That's where Google Analytics comes in. It's a free tool that you can use uh, on your website uh, where you basically just log in, you can see, okay, I got a thousand people on my website this month, where did they come from, how long did they stay, what pages did they view, uh, and if you get really good, you can even, you know, do some extra uh, tracking on there to, you know, how many people, if you have an online store, bought something. If you don't, you know, how many people fill out a form, or called you, or emailed you from your website. So all those sorts of things uh, are trackable, and we'll just give you that extra layer of, okay, I'm getting all this engagement, all this traffic from social media, but what's it actually getting me? You know, am I getting people contacting me? Am I getting just people that go on the website and immediately leave? You know, what, what's useful traffic and what isn't? Uh, and then A-B testing is also something uh, which is quite easy to do. Uh, it's also known as split testing, and it's basically taking the same ad and doing two versions of it, usually with a different photo. So same text. This could be, a, again, a few posting, a, uh, promoting a social media post, you can do the same thing, just post it twice, two different photos. See which photo people are responding to more. Use that information the next time to take a slightly better photo maybe. So over time, A-B testing is going to get you better posts and better ads by letting you directly see what's working and what isn't. Uh, by again, pitting two, and the, the, the crucial thing with A-B testing is to only change one variable. Because you can imagine if you have two completely different posts going to the same audience with different photos, different text, you know, different headline, let's say, one does way better than the other, well, what was it? You know, was it the headline that grabbed them? Was it the photo that grabbed them? By only having one variable, you can really tell 
what the test is. So here's a real world example. Uh, this is for a hot tub um, clearance sale. And exactly the same ad, exactly the same audience. The only difference is the photo. And one's twice as uh, productive as the other in terms of getting website traffic. Uh, and then you're also going to want to rotate your ads. So this would be more for boosting posts, you know, generally speaking, you're only going to want to run them for a few days anyway. But if you do want to do a longer ad, you know, if you wanted to spend $50 on one post because it is something that's, you know, very important, typically I'd only recommend, you know, maybe 5 or $10 a post just, just to get them out there a little bit extra. But if you did want to do a, a longer ad, know that people, once they see the same ad a few times, they get what they call <coughs> ad fatigue, where they just kind of stop caring. So you, you'll see it in the results. You know, if you look at, let's say, the cost per click, or the cost per engagement, whatever you're tracking, it might start off at, you know, 30 cents, 40 cents a click. A week later, it might be up to 50. Maybe a month later, it's up to your $2 a click or something like that. Because basically, everyone that's already seen the ad has clicked on it uh, that wants to, and now you're just kind of reaching people who are accidentally clicking on it because uh, they've seen it 100 times and you know they're just trying to scroll past it, basically. So we always recommend rotating out your ad creative once a week, once every couple of weeks, rather than boosting one post for a month, boost one post for a week, do another post on the same subject with maybe a different photo, boost that one. So just keeping things fresh, basically. Now, specific to recruiting, um, one, you're going to want to make sure uh, in your recruitment post slash ad uh, that you include a compelling image. The good thing and bad thing about social media advertising is that um, it, they call it blends into the user experience. So it's not a YouTube ad. You know, a YouTube ad, everyone hates them because you want to watch a video and it forces you to watch a completely different video. You can skip it after a few seconds, but at least for a few seconds you're, you're committed to something that you don't want to do. Uh, with a social media ad, you can scroll right past it. So it puts it in your, in your feed, but there's no stopping you, there's no making sure that you see it. You can scroll right past it. So people tend to respond a lot better to social media ads for that reason, but it also means that your ads are a lot more missable if they're not standing out in some way. So the biggest thing with that is going to be the image of the video, the, the visual of it. If that is something unique, something different, that's going to stop them from scrolling, they're going to stop scrolling, they're going to read your ad. If not, you've spent you know two hours crafting the absolute perfect wording, no one's going to read it because the image hasn't stopped them. Um, the next thing you want to do is be detailed in the post description. So rather than just, hey, we're hiring, you know, click here, it's, hey, here's where we're hiring, this is, you know, sort of the, the basics, and then learn more. So ideally, you don't want to be too long, like you don't want it to be the full job listing, but have a couple paragraphs of information in there. You know, the, the sort of things that you think. Think of it as an ad, basically, for the job. You're advertising this job, and how you sell this job to a good applicant. And have that level of detail in the actual post. And then advertise your job posting. So again, Facebook, Instagram, any sort of social media, they're not free anymore. The reach on, they call it organic reach, so the free reach of just publishing a post is next to nothing. Uh, less than 2% of you people that follow you will see a post that you do, generally. Um, so promoting it's going to get you, you know, five times, ten times the amount of people to see it. Uh, the other nice thing about social media advertising that this will kind of lead into is uh, sharing. So if I advertise something, if I see an ad and I like it, I comment it, I share it, anything like that, people who follow me are going to see that. And the advertiser isn't going to pay for those additional views. So there can be, not only are you getting, you know, a few, let's say a thousand people see it that you're paying for on the ad, you might get another thousand people that see it based on likes and comments. And typically uh, on job postings, you will get at least some engagement. Um, more so than others, you know, people will tag people they know that are looking for jobs or they'll share it with people because they know, again, people in their network are looking. So you generally do get a little bit of that sort of free uh, engagement as well. Uh, note, though, that you will have to, on Facebook and Instagram at least, 
uh, denote that it is an employment ad. They have a special category section when you go to do the ad, just a little toggle switch, and you have to put in that it's an employment ad or it will get um, rejected. Basically, what happens when you put it under a, as an employment ad is you can't age restrict it or gender restrict it. So it has to be available to everyone. Uh, and closing up, hopefully I didn't go too over time. Uh, good, okay, perfect. Um, I'm from Lure Marketing. Uh, we are a digital marketing company. We do everything in terms of website development, digital marketing, that could be social media, could be SEO, digital ads. Uh, if you need complete social media management or just some help you know, getting a job advertised, we can help you. Uh, we do have customized social media guides and one-on-one -on -one training as well. If you have an employee or yourself that you want to just get trained on social media and do it yourself, that is an option as well. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Any, if there's any questions, now's the time. If not, I guess I'll need a little time to unpack here that you can come up and talk to me as well. Anybody have any questions? Of course, you know, I'm going to comment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get the conversation rolling in this room. Um, so, if, you know, many of the people in this room are probably wondering, or they're thinking, how am I going to use this? You know, what good is this for me? You know, what's it going to do for me? There's all these questions going in there, as I know there is. And how am I going to find the time to do that? I want to give a couple examples of some businesses that are local that took their Instagram and, and how their business just exploded because of their Instagram and how they did it right. My first one is uh, XXL Scrunchy. I can't not <laughs> talk about them. Um, you know, the young woman that ran this company had basically a few followers off, off her Instagram. And what she wound up doing, somebody said, well, why don't you try adding some TikTok to that? Everybody knows this is the, the rage. So she did. She started doing some TikTok around her scrunchies, around how they're making them, some of the culture of the company, a number of things. She went and right now, as of today, has 116,000 followers on her Instagram. That's generating huge business for her now. She's been able to expand from a tiny little spot to a large location, bigger warehouse, hiring staff, which she had to use Instagram to help hire. And now she's selling product worldwide. That's a local, small, single owner business startup that's, that's done that. So that's a great example of how you can do that. Another great example, and everybody knows this place, Deli May Farms. I think everybody knows them. And how she went from, again, on Instagram, a small amount of followers and started doing, if you've ever watched her, and I follow her, and she gets that feed going for a day. It's so interesting following her from her time she goes to Toronto to pick up flowers and comes back and gets all the stuff done and gets out in the fields and does her work. Very interesting. She's now sitting at 96,000 followers. So imagine your business even if it doesn't increase to 96,000, how you can utilize that. My own business, I own, <clears throat> Dale mentioned I own a business, and I'm not going to say what it is, you can ask me later. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we took Instagram and started using it last year. <clears throat> Beginning of the year, I had 38 followers. I'm now just shy of 400 followers on our business. And those are all local followers for the most part. So that, that helps us increase our business profile as well. And then the last company I want to talk to you about is uh, something called the Machining Center, a niche manufacturer who has Instagram. He decided he wanted to use Instagram for trying to connect with, with companies across North America uh, that they could you know, try and sell their products to or get as new customers. He wound up using it actually for hiring, for attraction and retention. He wound up hiring co-op students, local co-op students who won Skills Ontario competition and how he learned about it was through Instagram. He wound up hiring staff through Instagram. So social media platform, it's, I'm, I'm adamant about this and I thank you know, Zach for sharing some of this. There's a lot that you can do with your company from hiring and attention to promoting your company through these social media platforms. And we have some great local businesses that are examples. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Talk about uh, using Facebook and Instagram. I go crazy trying to stay on top of all of the social media. Do you have a specific program like this?
suite that you would recommend for those of us who are new at all of this and just don't have time to hit all the places? Because you know, as much as the older folks are joining Facebook, the younger group are leaving Facebook and they're heading yeah. to Instagram and TikTok. I am not going to be able to do t all of these things and my dog. Right. So, yeah, is there a particular platform that you would recommend? Well, uh, I guess the somewhat good news is uh, since Facebook bought Instagram, you can actually schedule both right in Facebook. Um, so if that's all you're doing, that's all you really need. You don't really need to worry about a Hootsuite or a Buffer or anything like that. Um, but outside of that, if you are doing uh, a bunch of other, you know, well, name any other one, Twitter or, like you say, TikTok or something like that, uh, a scheduling tool like that would be helpful for sure. Um, I don't really have much allegiance to any particular one. I use Hootsuite, I use Buffer, but um, honestly, they're all about the same. So whoever's got a deal, I guess, okay. uh, whoever can get it to you the cheapest, they all basically have the same thing. Yep. Um, what's the optimal frequency um, to kind of stay active in somebody's feed? It depends a little bit on your audience, I would say. Uh, generally speaking, I wouldn't do less than three per week. Like three to five per week is generally a pretty good number of posts. Um, the, depending on your audience, though, and, and the platform, you know, like Twitter, you might want to do 15 or 20. Mm -hmm. But... Oftentimes, you're kind of repeating yourself two or three times for each post, so you still end up with kind of five posts. You're just doing each one three times. Uh, so it depends a little bit on the platform, but in general, if you said three to five posts per week, that's a pretty good amount, I would say, where you're, you're staying active, you're staying in front of people, but you're not uh, bombarding them, let, let's say, and you're also able to keep up the quality of posts. Uh, one big thing with social media is, uh, you know, sometimes it's better to post nothing if it's going to be just a quick post where you're... Just kind of throwing away something just in order to post because um, they all have algorithms now where they're looking to get the best post in front of the best people and if you're posting one out of four posts is just kind of a throwaway just to kind of make sure you're doing four posts per week if people aren't engaging with that post it will drop the overall engagement and they'll show you or post less to those people um, so you can actually end up reducing the amount of people that see your posts even though you're increasing the frequency of your posts. Um, so always go quality over quantity, but if you can, at least three per week, I would say, would be like a, a minimum sort of goal. I think that was a very long no, answer I to a very easy question. I appreciate the long answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah? Kind of to the question beforehand, would it also make sense to really think about your target you're wanting to talk to and your vision as a company and then just one of the social medias, like say if you're really talking to the Instagram people or the Facebook, then just focus on that if you're struggling to do a whole lot of things all at once, just focusing on one and then building from there. Yeah, that's a good that's a good way of doing it for sure. Yeah, if you don't have the time or the expertise or like you say, yeah, um, focusing in on the one social media platform that meets your demographics the best is a definite way of doing that. And then I like you say, as you say, if you get a little more time or a little more comfort, you know, as with anything else, the first month you're doing social media, you're going to be spending a lot more time on each individual post than you will six months or a year from now because you kind of get a certain rhythm and you'll, you'll kind of know what posts start to work and there'll be some efficiencies that way that, you know, you might find again you have an extra hour a week now because your posts are so easy to do that you can add in a second.